Welcome to the IRP tribute to Stephen Hawking. A few words about the IRP. We were founded in uh, 1962, and we've been um, nurtured by the New School ever since then. Thank you to the New School. Uh, we are a post-career peer learning community. We have no paid faculty, and the members coordinate our study groups in which all members participate in lively discussions and very passionately, I might add. We are a blueprint for the lifelong learning movement and it's now replicated in over 500 campuses around the country. So our Fridays at One has been going on for at least 20 years and we have three, three sessions every semester that's open to the public where we bring in speakers and today's speakers are IRP members um, who are going to talk about Stephen Hawking, who died last March. He was a theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and author. Um, I can't begin to tell you anything about him, but our speakers can, fortunately. So the first speaker is John Gillespie, astrophysicist. He's been a member of the IRP since 20. 2013. He got his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. He's done research at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, Columbia University, the University of Paris, and the French Atomic Energy Center. He's a professor emeritus of physics and astronomy at CUNY Lehman College. He's also been active on the Human Rights Committees, New York Academy of Sciences, American Physical Society, American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has coordinated many study groups, and I have a big announcement. He will be teaching science and literature in the spring. <laughs> so look for it on your grid that's coming out sometime. The second speaker is Reuben Ofer, cosmologist. He's been an IRP member since 2017. He has his PhD from Harvard under the supervision of 1989 Nobel laureate Norman Ramsey. He was a professor of physics for 18 years at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. He was a professor of astronomy and professor emeritus at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's coordinated two study groups, I believe, since he started on cosmology in the spring and fall of 2018. And in the next spring, he will be um, leading a study group on the Bible on Earth. So John will begin speaking, and then Reuben's going to pick up, and John will uh, come back with some predictions that Stephen Hawking had made. So welcome to our speakers. Let me start with a few biographical remarks. Uh, Hawking was born in 1942 in Oxford, uh, entered the university there as an undergraduate. Both his parents had graduated from Oxford. And then he moved to Cambridge for his um, doctoral work. In the early years of his graduate work, he was diagnosed with ALS, the Lou Gehrig degree, uh, amyolateral sclerosis. It's a neurodegenerative disease that usually takes one's life within two years. So, of course, that threw him into a deep depression, but his resolve plus the support of his family and his colleagues, he decided to carry on. He died this year at age 76. Um, it was, blessedly, it was a very slowly progressing disease. It did progress. There were times where he lost his ability to speak, and then the whole community of <clears throat> researchers on sp uh, speech synthesis and speech recognition developed equipment so that with a few nerves in his face, he was able to communicate. Um, he then became the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge. This is the chair that Isaac Newton held. And he was also the director of the Center for Theoretical uh, Cosmology. I don't know what experimental cosmology might be. Uh, so he died this year. He's buried in Westminster Abbey next to Darwin and Newton. So 
first, a quick resume of what was the atmosphere of physics as he entered it. So I'm just a few years ahead of, ahead of him, so I have uh, some experience. The, gra the holy grail of physics at that point, and this, in a sense, is unification. There are four forces in nature, electromagnetic, nuclear, weak and strong, and gravitation. So there was a steady progression in the 19th century. Maxwell started with uh, experiments or with the data from experiments in electricity and in magnetism, developed the equations that described them, noticed from that that there was a wave equation and predicted that our electromagnetic waves could propagate through space. And when, he calcu when you calculate the speed, it turns out to be the speed of light. So suddenly, we understand what light is. Electricity and magnetism are unified. And it's a remarkable, ex exciting adventure to go through that development. Uh, that's why a lot of us became physicists. Then far, fast forward to the 50s and 60s, <clears throat> where the unification program continued. Um, first, the weak nuclear forces and electromagnetic forces were unified to a single theory, that electroweak theory. And then over time, in a hardly continuous way, we, do, we incorporated the strong nuclear forces into the, the theory that accommodates electromagnetism in the weak nuclear force, and that's called the standard model. And you heard about that earlier, in a few years ago, when the Higgs particle was predicted, because for a, particle, for a theory to be respected, you have to accommodate the already known data, but it's ideal, ideally, you predict something that's not been seen before and then find it. And the Higgs boson was found at CERN with a small piece of equipment that's only 27 miles around. <laughs> uh, now, what's missing from all this is the ability to incorporate gravity. Einstein, Einstein struggled with that most of the latter, latter part of his life. Uh, the problem is that there are aspects of gravitational theory which describes nature at a very small scale that have inherent uncertainties. And it's very hard to accommodate those, those aspects into a theory of large-scale phenomena such as described by general relativity. So that's the ideal, to try to accommodate both gravitation and the other forces in a single theory. And as Reuven will describe to us, that was really the, the major theme of Hawking's research. Uh, in, in particular, um, he studied black holes, which are more interesting than was understood a few years ago, and that leads to Hawking um, radiation, which Reuven will tell you everything about the universe. What, what was before Genesis, what's after the apocalypse. Um, now, there, so his research career was working on the unification of gravitation, quantum mechanics, and thermodynamics, uh, radiation from black holes. But beyond physics, he had many other concerns. He had a deep concern with the future of humanity. He even thought that if we messed up this planet, that for us, for humanity to survive, we should perhaps explore extraterrestrial life and even migrating to Mars. Uh, he also was, as I'll mention went after Reuven, uh, a leader in the program to alert governments to the profound dangers of artificial intelligence, some of which are already being developed. Uh, and so, even beyond that, he, of course, is a masterful communicator of science to the public. You've probably, you, of course, all bought his book. Ten million people did. So I let Reuven carry well, on. Well, first of all, thanks for coming. Thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, 
I love, well, it's probably people that are in my class know I love physics, I love cosmology, and I love to have the possibility of maybe transmitting a little bit of my, uh, my love for the, for the field. Uh, Hawking, have, the science contribution of Hawking is primarily in two fields. One is black holes, and the other is the beginning of the universe. If you've never seen a black hole, we got a picture of it, so why don't, why don't you show the people what a black hole looks like. So that's a black hole. Uh, the, our knowledge of a black hole and the prediction of a black hole comes from the theory of Einstein, uh, which is basically the following. He, made, he wrote a special relativity, he had a general relativity, what is the basic idea behind Einstein's relativity? And the basic idea is that time is not absolute. Before Einstein, we had in Newton's theory and in all physics, until New Einstein came, we always thought that, you know, we know what time is, and time we get older, and that's it. And Einstein came in with this fantastic perception that time is not absolute. That if I have a, a watch and uh, you have a watch, the same watch, got it, I got it on Amazon, uh, same watch, you go on a train and I look at your watch and you're going slower. Your watch is going slower. The crazy thing is, the craziest thing is, you look at my watch and you say, hey, your watch is going slower. That is special relativity. Uh, what it turns out, he built a theory that on the basis of what is constant, the speed of light. Why is the speed of light constant? That's what nature gave us. We, there's no reason. We just measure it. We find it. It's always he built a theory that the speed of light is always constant. And if you do that, uh, you find that time could change. Uh, for instance, uh, not only this experiment of the moving train, but for instance, astronauts that go out into space uh, and come back, they, you find that the uh, time has changed. His time has, has uh, because he's been moving around, <laughs> you know, around in the, uh, 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 in space, and he comes back, his clock is behind. He's gone slower. So it has been measured. We've seen it. And obviously, it's the craziest thing, prediction is, is the twin paradox. The twins, one stays on Earth, the other one goes into a rocket, goes to the nearest star and the speed, near the speed of light, comes back, we're all 80 years old, <laughs> and he's 30. But on the other hand, everything is relative, the change. So you would say that if he looks at my clock, then my clock should be going slower. But it turns out that he is really 20 years old, and I am 80 years old. The difference turns out, you'll have to come to my course, is that he changed, he turned around. That sounds crazy, but I'll show it to you in the class. Okay, that is special relativity. Motion changes time. So what is general relativity? It took 10 years for him to work this out. He says that what general relativity says, that matter, matter changes time. If I if I put my clock near something heavy, my clock is going to go slower. The fact is this, this also has been observed. Your clocks are going slower than the exact same clock that's in a satellite. And in fact, your GPS, you never went into it, but uh, they know about this. And actually, they have to take into account and the fact is that your clock goes slower 40 
microseconds per day slower because of the, the Earth. The mass of the Earth causes your clock to go slower 40 microseconds. Well, if mass makes the clock go slower, what about if I get more and more mass dense, more and more dense mass? For example, if the sun, if I take the sun and squash it all the way down to around three kilometers, the mass of the sun into three a radius of three kilometers, your clock stops. The mass, the gravity of the black hole is so strong that the clock time stops. If I see somebody going in principle, uh, a watch or anyone that has a clock, and when he gets near the black hole, I look at it, and for me, it stopped. That's from Einstein's theory. So, so where does Hawking come in? Well, Hawking said that, okay, that is uh, relativity. But we have another area of physics that's called quantum mechanics. And so we really don't have a unified theory of quantum mechanics and relativity, but we can take a little, maybe a little piece of, the, of uh, quantum mechanics and apply it to this idea that we talked about, a black hole, uh, Einstein's theory uh, uh, for a uh, black hole. What did he do? Well, something, what part of quantum mechanics did he take? Uh, a, one, one of the things that, what does quantum mechanics talk about? Quantum mechanics talks about probability. Everything is probability. And only when we observe something does something become real, you know, actual. Well, one of the famous uh, characteristics of quantum mechanics is something what's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's a real funny kind of a thing. If I take a box, I take all the atoms away from, from the box, no atoms in the box, what is the Heisenberg certainty principle? It's not empty. Even though I took all the atoms away, it's not empty. Someone appears, things appear, but when I want to see what appears, it disappears. So for me, it's empty, but the box is full of activity, creating, and then here I am, I'm gone. Here I am, I'm gone. I don't see anything, but the theory says that they're there. Well, so what did Hawking say? What happens if I take, I create two particles? Let's say something like two bricks. If I take two bricks, but they're somehow connected. They normally would appear and they disappear, appear and disappear. But what would happen, that's what Hawking said, what would happen if one of the bricks fall into the black hole? If something falls, into gravity, you know, a brick, you drop a brick, there's a lot of energy that goes in when it falls in. But these two bricks are connected. So the energy, he works it out, that the energy that the black hole gets by falling into the black hole is connected to the other one. And to the other one, he can give this, transmit this energy, and so that the other, the other brick flies out so he has, so what happens, what we observe is not that the black hole is black, but things are flying out. And that is probably the most famous thing that Hawking did. It's called Hawking radiation. Black holes are not black, but they radiate. And to be clear that this is not a bubomyces, this is not something <laughs> Just a simple story, we see black holes in every single galaxy of stars. At the, the center of every galaxy, there's a black hole. So black holes are real, and black holes have this characteristic. They radiate. Uh, another thing that, there were many, a number of things that Hawking didn't start, but he was involved with these, these other things. Another thing is that 
We talked about that matter cur changes time and space. Well, I get two black holes. They're both changing time and space. And if they come together, well, they're changing space and time. And then they'll, they'll create, you know, to disturb you. Throw a brick into, uh, into, into a pond of water. You're, you're going to make waves. Well, these waves are called gravity waves of space and time moving around, spread, spreading out. And we, they're called gravitational waves. And these gravitational waves have been observed. Uh, in fact, it's sort of crazy. If I had a, have a, had a ruler in September 2015, I would, in principle, I could see my ruler got smaller and bigger, smaller and bigger. And this was observed by two black holes a billion light years away from us, came together, made these waves, it came here, and made my ruler go back and forth. And this has been observed. So that's sort of a second thing that he did with black holes. A third thing, we have something that is probably not, the, 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 the not it's probably one of the most uh, complicated uh, concepts for, for students to understand. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. And what is the second law of thermodynamics? In other words, we, now that we know what relativity is, we'll go into another area, and we, talk, we know what quantum mechanics is, and there's the third law, a third area of physics, it's thermodynamics, and the second law says that essentially it's hard even to, to explain. I can, I can explain in an example what the second law says. If I show you a picture of this room, one picture, and I have a glass in that picture, then I push the glass off and it shatters in all pieces. I take another picture. I show you both pictures. And I ask you, which came first? Everyone will know that the picture, that the glass on the table came first, because what the, we're not going to get all the pieces together. That's what the second law says, that essentially our world seems to be like this glass. It's keeping on getting more complicated. Or we need more information. It's, it's, it's expressed in different ways. We need more information to express what we have. The world need, gets more and more information. It needs more information to explain it. But what about the black hole? The black hole says, if I have a complicated, uh, uh, well, all right, let's make it really dramatic for us, a Rembrandt picture. It has an awful lot of information there. And it goes into the black hole, and it's gone. All the information, all the beauty, all whatever content that Rembrandt picture had is gone. And what about the second law? It says that that can, can't happen. So Hawking worked out and he says, you know what? And, he, and it was a debate, I think, for 30, 40 years. But right before he died, he said, no, I got a solution. And the solution is that before the Rembrandt picture says goodbye and fell into the black hole. He gave all his information to the surface of the black hole, and eventually it'll radiate, and the information will come back to us. So we didn't lose the information of the Rembrandt. Eventually, we'll get it back again. That is his solution. The third thing that he did with black holes is that uh, we talk about that it's black. Okay, that it radiates. But let's say, what is the temperature? You know, if we, if someone, if an astronaut fell in to a black hole, what, what would he see? How, what, what, what's going on near the surface of the black hole? Well, we know that if we take a brick and, and drop a brick on the Earth from space, it's going to go with a, a lot of energy 
bang, when it hits the Earth. Well, if you can take the black hole and you say whatever came out, radiate came out, what happened if we reversed? How much energy did I need to, to send this rocket, this particle, out into space from the black hole? Well, it's almost, it's an enormous amount of energy. So that, essentially, if I'm saying that everything that I send out, that it radiates, it starts from the surface of the black hole, it means that the surface of the black hole has an extremely high temperature, and if an astronaut falls in, or you fall in, or anybody falls in, you'll be burned to a crisp. And that's the fourth thing that Hawking said about black holes. So, black holes radiate, black holes create gravitational waves, uh, we don't lose the information of uh, falling into a black hole, and the fourth thing is that if you go, you will be burned to a crisp. Okay, that's one area. The next area, if, you, if we had enough pictures of the black hole, now I'll show you a picture of the beginning of the universe. That's how it looks. Well, that's the second area that uh, Einstein dealt with, the beginning of the universe. First, we say, let's start really even before the universe began. Uh, we say that, what does the beginning of the universe mean? Well, as I say, the whole relativity, the whole Einstein theory is that matter affects space and time. If we talk, we say that the universe began we talk about that space and time began at creation. And so what happened before? Where's the space and time before? We don't like it. So people said that, okay, maybe, ah, all right, we don't like this. Let's assume that the universe oscillates. Oscillates. Now we see it in the expanding phase, but actually uh, it, it'll eventually collapse again and actually before our beginning, our beginning that we see, the universe collapsed and there was, it just kept on collapsing, expanding and collapsing. But then you put in the second law of thermodynamics that says somehow time only, only goes forward. I can't pick up the glass pieces and make a glass. And so that, in other words, if I collapse and I reverse time to make the start, start all over again, it would mean like I would be taking the pieces of glass and making a glass out of it. And that is against the second law of thermodynamics. So Hawking says that because of the second law of thermodynamics, this oscillating universe doesn't work, and like it or not, the beginning of creation is the beginning of time, and that's it. Okay, that's one thing he de I dealt with. The second thing he dealt with is right after the beginning of time, beginning of the creation of the universe. Essentially, what he said is, and and he used Einstein's equations, and he showed that right at the beginning, 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 Einstein's equation isn't valid. It's what they call in the physics singularity. It means it doesn't work. Ah, but if we have quantum mechanics and we put it together at, at the beginning of the universe, then we might be able to solve the problem of the singularity. Where the, but let, 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 me, let me, this is how crazy physicists are. That's right, probably. I'm crazy. But when, when we talk about the beginning of the universe, 
What are we talking about? How big is this, you, this singularity with, where, where gravity breaks down? Because you see in the newspapers, that's what he's famous for. How big was the universe at that time? It was a billionth, a billionth, a billionth the size of the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. That was the size of, that was the size of the nucleus that we're worried about. But he said that he implied there is no theory, but essentially he implied that quantum mechanics, if you have a unified theory, then it might fix up the singularity of, of, of relativity. Time will come into packets, packets like in quantum mechanics, and somehow it'll be resolved. But after it, it's bigger than this billionth, billionth, billionth of the size of a, of a nucleus of a hydrogen atom, there's no problem. Then, then Einstein's theory is okay. We don't have to worry about the unified field theory. Uh, then he, he was involved in, in another, other, other something else that is connected. He didn't start the, the theory, the area, but he was active in the area. It's called primordial inflation. And there, it's to try to explain various phenomena. Obviously, you think you know the, what the beginning of the universe is from the picture, but immediately, you have certain observations that are problematic. One, we can measure, we have ways to measure somehow when the beginning of the universe is. We may age. We have maybe, you heard that we're 14 billion years uh, since the creation. Uh, we see the expanding universe. We can start measuring when it came back. We have various ways to measure. We're 14 billion years. Well, if the universe is 14 billion years, and the fastest thing that can go is, we would think it would be the speed of light. So we have a size of the universe, what we think exists. But we look up, the observable universe is much bigger than that. So that's one problem. The observable universe is much bigger than the speed of light times the age of the universe. So that's one problem. Another problem, where did galaxies come from? Where did we come from? Can, you, can we come from that kind of stuff? Everything's just expanding gas, hot stuff, gas coming, light radiation, no. So where do we come from? Where did galaxies come from? Where did stars come from? We need, we need clumps, not, 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 not something like that. We need clumps coming together that will eventually collapse. So we need clumps. How do we get the clumps? Uh, another funny thing. That, okay, the universe is expanding and we have matter pulling the stuff in. So we create a universe like that, a certain amount of kinetic energy, but we put in some numbers and we find that, that for a given picture like that, expanding universe, we put in a certain matter, <coughs> the universe will collapse immediately. We put a little less matter in it and it'll disappear almost immediately. But we're around here for 14 billion years. So what happened? Turns out that the only thing that seems to imply is that there was such a delicate balance between how much matter pulls in and the, this kinetic energy of the stuff pulling out that we can last around 14 billion years. Well, so you have these problems, and how is it suggested to be solved? <clears throat> it's suggested to be solved by if the universe expanded faster than the speed of light at the beginning, the space 
created and it went much very, very fast. Okay, first of all, how do you, let's go slow. How do, how do you do that trick? How do you make space go so fast, faster than the speed of light? Well, first of all, I have to make a comment that when we say that something can't go faster than the speed of light, we're talking about my space, that any space that an observer is going to measure the speed of light, he'll only, particles won't go faster than the speed of light. But we're not talking about space. The space itself, the space itself, well, how do I make the space itself go faster than the speed of light? That's all I need to, to maybe solve these problems. Well, we're just thinking, you know, we're, we're together. Let's think together. How are we going to make the space uh, go faster than the speed of light? Well, all we need is really a simplified, a the, uh, the, one of the equations of Einstein. One of the equations of Einstein in general, I'll tell you, what does it say? It says that the, the acceleration, how fast velocity changes when, when I, th I throw a brick up in the air. The velocity, the speed of the brick goes slower and slower. Why? Because the earth is pulling on the brick. It slows it down. This seems to always be true. So in other words, the basic equation of Einstein should be true, that the slowing down of the brick is balanced by some mass, the gravitational pull of some mass. That's the equation that we know about. But in Einstein's equation, he has something that, that we never have to worry about. He says it's not just the, that the energy is, the, you know, the E is equal to mc squared. Uh, the energy or the mass is not just concentrated in, in mass, like the, uh, like the table, like, like the Earth. But it's also connected with the forces between the particles. And so the equation is not just matter. It's plus, where matter is, it's matter plus three times pressure. And what, hap and what is pressure? Pressure is like particles going to push. But what happens if I put, make kind of particles that don't push? but pull one another, negative pressure. So what the equation says, that if I make particles with, <coughs> that pull one another, with a lot of, lot of, lot of energy, these particles will make this, the, uh, the space and everything go faster than the speed of light. So that's, but, he, but Hawking was involved in this. He wasn't the one normally you hear that suggested this, this theory. Let me maybe sort of summarize. So just summarize first on the beginning of the universe. The beginning of the universe, he talked about what is time before the beginning of the universe. There is no time right after Essentially, we need a unified th field theory to explain what happens immediately afterwards. And uh, we talk about this, this idea that space itself is expanding very fast, and that's why we see that the universe is bigger than the time, uh, uh, the speed of light. Oh, clumps. How do we make the clumps? I forgot to tell you. The clumps, he said, it's not him, it's not him. Other people said it before him, but he got involved in it. How do you make the clumps? You make the clumps by the same thing with this quantum mechanic business. 
There's quantum mechanics, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I'm making clumps, remember, two bricks, and I put them together for the things that go so fast. If I look, I don't see them. But with the black hole, we said we justified the creation of radiation by one of the brick holes, a bricks falling into the black hole, its energy transferred to the other black hole, brick, and it goes out. That's the radiation. What does he say, what do they say uh, on, uh, uh, in the beginning of the universe? Again, vacuum, I'm creating, destroying, creating, and destroying. But if I have this expansion of the universe, it's a billion, billion, billion times faster than the speed of light, anything I create will be separated. Any clump I make will be separated. And these clumps will remain in that big bang, and they make the galaxies, okay? So the beginning of the universe, time before the beginning of the universe, right after, the universe is expanding very fast to explain why we observe the, the universe is bigger than the time by, times the speed of light, why there, are, uh, why there are clumps, and maybe I'll explain also in a few minutes to explain how the, why does the matter, the amount of matter in the universe, is, looks like it's so finely tuned. In other words, the kinetic, the kinetic energy is just balanced that it's gonna, the universe is going to last for 14 billion years. Well, it turns out, again, in Einstein's equation, that the difference between the kinetic energy and the gravitational energy is a term that's proportional to, to a constant divided by the size of the universe. If I make a very big universe and then I start the Big Bang, they, I'm going to balance the kinetic energy and potential energy automatically. And, that's, and so that problem is also solved. Okay. Sure. You know, but I have a few more minutes. <laughs> he started. He, he ended at 15. I really have another 10 your minutes. Wa your watch is slower than my watch. <laughs> I'm finishing anyway. Okay. So, uh, so, Hawking did these things with the black hole, four things, and the four things with the uh, 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 beginning of the universe. So what is the legacy of Hawking? Is he like Einstein? What is science? We got maybe a few words on science. Science are observations. You have to make a theory that you predict something, and then you observe it. The only thing that Hawking was involved with, that he made a prediction, was his Hawking radiation, that black holes radiate. We never saw a black, we never saw a black hole radiating with Hawking radiation. Everything else he was combined was sort of that other people were, were active in, in science. Other people suggested it. All these other things that I, I mentioned. Einstein was, was a real creator with this changing time, that time is not absolute. So uh, Hawking is no Einstein. Hawking made a, predict, made a theory that he predicts that was never observed. And he contributed, he he contributed to the various areas that I explained. And so, summarizing, Hawking is a good scientist, but no Einstein. <laughs> okay. Let me um, now mention two aspects of the person, uh, Hawking, about which you're one you're very familiar with and one not. The more surprising one is he was intensely interested in the survival of humanity, and he was doubtful about it. He thought we're messing up this planet. He uh, was very involved in supporting groups that were looking for extra signals of extra galactic or extra solar system life, 
and he was wondering what would happen if we messed up this planet, would we be able to colonize Mars? So it's, it's sort of a paranoid fantasy domain. But there's this e another element that's very important about which we're generally less familiar is the dangers of super intelligent artificial intelligence. Now, we know we each have a different impression. What does artificial intelligence mean? Is it fast computers? Is it uh, beating the chief players in, Go, in uh, Go or in chess? Is it running big systems uh, that are extraordinarily complex? So, and there are simple examples that we attribute to artificial intelligence. For example, if you fly from Kennedy to London, your pilot is actually at the controls as little as 45 minutes. The rest is not his decision, but the planes in contact. Uh, you can do things in literature with artificial intelligence. You could say, did Shakespeare write this text? And you do that by analyzing the text in great detail, figuring out every the frequency for every letter, every word, every phrase. So there are a number of things where they go slightly beyond the idea of just doing things more quickly and more massive, cal involving more massive calculations. But you can begin to devise systems that learn, just as the human brain, when you do something frequently, reinforces the synapses for that particular pathway, the system will learn and eventually it improves itself, it corrects itself, it rewrites itself. And the point is, at what point does the person who originated it, does the programmer become irrelevant? At what point does he lose control over what's happening? There, there's a long history of building human-like creatures that get out of our control. There is the... Uh, Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's monster. He's built, by the way, there's not much science fiction in her novel. The science, she knew the science of the time extremely well. And she knew, for example, that the human body moves through electrical signals and such. But the interesting thing is what happens to human values? Now the monster in Shelley's Frankenstein is in fact the most ethical and noble soul in the entire book. And uh, there are other examples, for example, in, in the cinema. Oh, there's in the Middle Ages, there's the golem from Prague. And the golem was made from earth, and its role was to protect the ghetto. And he, it eventually went out of control and had to be destroyed. And then, of course, we have a, a rich uh, tradition in, in cinema. We have Hal in 2001. We have Ex Machina. All of these are the fear that we will lose control of what we invent or what we create. And there's another much more general question, which is, if I design systems that are going to do what people do, by the way, some, there's questions asked, um, what do humans do? And the answer is, what artificial intelligence can't do yet. And so here's the challenge. How do you incorporate into the system that you build human values, morality, ethics, religion, as you, as you like? You could put it in. Maybe you can translate the, the um, Ten Commandments into Fortran. I don't know. But if the system teaches itself and learns and rewrites itself, how much of that will survive? So very specifically, Hawking uh, and... Uh, Musk, you know Musk, the flamboyant, extraordinarily clever, let's call him an engineer, who is also terribly concerned with the future of mankind. And the two of them wrote a letter, open letter to the United Nations. And the open letter said, be careful, stop the possibility of militarizing space. And there are examples already. There are of course, we have unmanned cars, but there are also uh, killer drones. There are killer tanks. So already it's starting, and the military is always at the very leading edge of anything like 
artificial intelligence. So their letter to the United Nations, which was then signed by over 100 of the biggest mockers in information technology and computing, all of the people from um, Google, from Amazon, from Microsoft, are likewise terribly concerned about what happens when you militarize space. And so the, it, wars have evolved, as Hawkins was concerned about, wars have gone from guns to nuclear weapons and now to artificial intelligence. And to give you briefly a few of the phrases that I picked from what they've been writing, Hawking has said super intelligent artificial intelligence could be pivotal in steering humanity's fate. Concern for the future of humanity is something we must consider. Musk said, if there's a World War III, it will probably be executed by artificial intelligence from space. And Putin has thoughts on it. He said that there threats, it, it yields threats that are difficult to predict. And finally, Putin said, the global leader in artificial intelligence would become the leader of the world. So this isn't just a lunch table fantasy at Google. This is something all of the people deeply involved are deeply concerned about. And so Musk wrote his letter. Musk, like uh, Hawking, like Einstein, knew they were famous and used that fame to communicate to governing structures. It's a parallel with the 1939 letter that Einstein wrote to Roosevelt. And he explained the Germans are working on nuclear weapons. You should be aware of the risk that involves and that led more or less directly to the Manhattan Project. So as Einstein wrote to Roosevelt, Hawking and Musk wrote to the United Nations. And they asked each of the people that signed on to the letter to write to their government. So this is one of his biggest concerns and where he involves in issues, if you like, far from physics, but still a thoughtful, imaginative person. It sounds like an odd couple, Musk and Hawking, but they have some things in common. They both were fascinated by space, and they approached space in different spectacular ways. Hawking always dreamed of being able to go to space and experiencing life without gravity. So Richard Branson, offered him the opportunity. He lent him one of his planes from uh, Virgin Galaxy. And these, go in, these are to train the ast astronauts who are going go into space. And as you know, Branson's selling one-way tickets to Mars. And this is training the people that may go. So they put Hawking in one of these planes and let him, in 10-minute intervals, float with zero gravity. The other people are there just to protect him but he is in space without gravity. So it's why he likewise is very concerned if artificial intelligence takes over space and it's managed by the military, then what dangers are presented to humanity. This is another shot of him without gravity. Now Musk, as you know, um, is never guilty of understatement. And he, <laughs> and he wanted the world to know. He, developed, he does things that the other people might have dreamed of but don't do. So for example, electric cars. No one was making electric cars. He did. No one was making very powerful rockets to launch, launch the tools for exploring uh, space. So he did two things. First, he developed very powerful rockets, which Boeing and NASA and Russia and China didn't do. And then he found ways to recover the launching equipment, the boosters. Normally, you throw them away in the ocean. He said, why not bring them back? And Boeing and IBM and NASA in the military and Russia and China said, you can't do that. It would be like hurling a pencil from the moon and asking it to land on its eraser with no outside guidance. So Musk, of course, took that as a challenge. And he also is good at choreography. So he would have pairs and, pairs and triplets of the boosters come back and land on their, on their tail uh, by themselves. And then to be sure that no one underestimated what he could do, where did it go? 
Let me find it. He sent Spaceman up. Now, this is a space suit with no one in it. It's called Spaceman. He's listening to David Bowie on the radio of this electric red convertible uh, car. It's in permanent orbit around the sun. It's orbit that crosses that of uh, the Earth and Mars. It will be there forever and ever or at least until the sun dies, which will be in four billion years. <laughs> and so these are two people that love space, have wild fantasies, and are deeply concerned about issues beyond their science. And then finally, the last aspect is better known, is the communication of science to the public. Now, in the 19th century, science was a part of general culture. Shelley and her poet, the husband, certainly knew the science of their time. They certainly knew about Newton and his laws. They knew about Galileo. They maybe were learning about Darwin. They knew science. It was part of culture. In the 20th century, science became more, more mathematical. Scientists became more specific. Until that time, physics departments were always called natural philosophy. And then they became physics, chemistry, biology. And so in general, the, the culture started to diverge. And you know C.P. Snow wrote his book, The Two Cultures, saying the science and the humanities no longer communicate. That's unfortunate. There's even a certain amount of hostility. People are proud of not knowing science. Uh, he said of not knowing the second law of thermodynamics is like not having read Shakespeare. He later admitted that was a dumb choice of metaphor. <laughs> But he also spoke of the third culture, and that's very important. These are the people who know science and communicate it. So we, there's a long list of these people, Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Richard Feynman, Richard Dawkins, uh, Rovelli, Steven Pinker. These people, plus the fascination with what's going on in space, have in the 21st century brought science back into our culture. And it's these communicators, the third culture, that has brought them together in a very, very fruitful way. So just as you can appreciate Schubert without reading a musical score and without knowing the theory of harmony, you can now appreciate what's going on by the cosmologist and in space without reading equations and without uh, understanding physics. It's a part of our culture. And a major factor in that, well, that obviously Hawking is one of the major contributors to that project. He wrote his book, and to give you a few statistics, he sold 10 million copies. That's one for every 700 humans on Earth. And as he said, it's probably the world's most bought, least read book. <laughs> All of us accessorized our coffee table with it. All of, it carried, all of us carried it into our elevator or to our wine bar. But 10 million people across 40 languages means that there is an evolution from the 19th century where science was a part of the culture to the 20th century where it wasn't, and now it is again. That's particularly helped by the change in generations, kids, love space, and they learn it. And if you work as I do as an explainer at the Museum of Natural History, one of the most interesting phenomena is to go through the museum and listening to kids explaining the exhibits to their parents and their grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> so if your kids take, grandkids take you to the museum, be prepared. So anyhow, Hawkins then is, a, is the most extreme example of successful inspiration for exploring space by people who are not scientists, who aren't trained in that way, but who acknowledge it as a part of our culture. So then his, we have, we're paying tribute to Hawkins, the physicist, Hawkins, the person who demonstrated great resilience in the face of physical handicap, and Hawkins, who's concerned with the future of humanity, and then has become a master at communicating that science to our, to our culture. So he's taught us a lot. Thank you.
Thank you both. Uh, we're now going to have a 15 minutes uh, questions and answers. And Leslie and Ken are going to be um, moving the mic around. And I'll pick someone, and you can address it to uh, either or both gentlemen. Right back there. OK. I, I don't think I need this. Can you hear me without it? Please use it. OK. Be sure to make it a question also. Uh, Reuven, my question, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, at the singularity, you indicated that a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of some atom presumably was matter. And if it's matter, where did it come from? In the same way. Hello? Yeah. In the same way that my answer would be probably similar to Hawking. In the same way that we don't talk about time, what happened time before creation, uh, time, space, matter, they're all connected. That is the unit that we talk about. And if we can't talk about time, then we can't talk about matter before, the, before what we call creation. Next question. Yeah, um, I, I may have misheard you, but I thought you were being optimistic about being able to bring back Rembrandt from a black hole, if I'm not mistaken. And if you were talking about that, then I, I got confused about how that relates to the second law of thermodynamics, where things are you know, unable to come back into order. So I, I'd like that understood better. The idea is that a... Uh, a Rembrandt picture has a lot of information that Rembrandt put into it. According just to the Einstein picture, if we just look at the Einstein picture, that all that information is gone. The idea is that we're in our world, the second law says that information increases, not decreases. And so that was a big problem. And he, I'm not saying that he solved it. One of the things I think maybe just word, what is science? Science is not truth. It's not truth. It's just making order of observations. That's what it is. So you see some observations. This is the definition of science. You see some observations. I have a theory how to explain those kind of observations. I go down, I sit in my office, and I make some mathematical equations, and I say, my equations are going to predict similar observations. If I predict correctly, it's a good theory. It's a good theory. If I didn't predict anything, for example, so what is it? It's my feeling. All right, I, I'm going to be especially for you just here, let's exaggerate. It's just philosophy. It's not science. Unified field theory, string theory, M theory, uh, infinite number of universes. Did anyone see another universe? Do they have any predictions in the, in the M theory string? If they don't, it's philosophy. So, into your question, it's philosophy, you know. That's all. You spoke about Musk and Hawking cautioning governance entities against artificial intelligence. In history, has there been any similar activity that occurred that the governing people actually did something about? Well, we do claim that we control nuclear proliferation. Who polices it, how well they police it, you don't know. That Roosevelt understood Einstein's warning, we don't know. But yes, that's, a, that's an example. There are limits, there are international limits to gas warfare. There are limits to nuclear pr proliferation. And so 
the difference will be that artificial intelligence is immaterial. Where is it? For nuclear concerns, there are factories, there are silos, there are, there are vehicles in space, and you can detect it, you can see it, and you can try to regulate it through the UN if lacking anything else. But otherwise, it seems to be self-regulating. Look at the humans who are running the countries that have nuclear weapons. The United States, England, France, Pakistan, Israel, uh, China. Do you think these people are truly understanding the risks that they're managing? I don't know. But the nuclear weapons, I mean, war progressed from guns to nuclear to artificial intelligence. And each time it becomes more abstract, more difficult to understand. And personally, I find it a bit of a miracle that we've contained nuclear weapons as well as we have. I don't know if someone did it. I don't you speak of agency. It simply happened. So I think that's one example, gas warfare and nuclear proliferation. But this is truly more abstract. This is immaterial. It has no location. It has no mass. It's, it's not even in our heads. It's in our computers' heads. <laughs> is that what you were thinking of? Yeah, I mean, talking about nuclear weapons, uh, as you correctly observed, it's something tangible, whereas AI is not. That's right. That, that's number one. Number two, <clears throat> I don't know to what extent nuclear weapons have not proliferated or rather to what extent the proliferation will not start because we had a nuclear arms deal with Iran and I don't know where it's going to end up eventually. I have no idea. Uh, and if Iran were to pursue it, what happens to Saudi Arabia? And it's so on and on and on. Uh, the only thing I can say is other than us, Nobody's used them. So we far. have them, but we. Yeah, it's, a good, it's a good question. Why not? You know, nobody's used them. Uh, North and maybe Korea because there them. hasn't been a major uh, war. Uh, yeah. And if there were, if somebody felt cornered, maybe we would. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, what Musk and Hawkins were worried about, we speak of national leaders that have the red button. Their concern is that they, the generals and the rulers of the countries will have a button that, for artificial intelligence that says, win war. Yeah. <laughs> and then who is in control of it? Who knows what victory means? And where are any kind of human values injected into the system? That's the real concern, is that we, uh, we may be the leftovers after artificial intelligence begins to run everything, but we do have as a civilization ideals ethics, morality, civilian deaths, and so on. It's not clear that they can or will inject these in a durable fashion into their systems. I don't know. Thank you. Next question. Let's talk about another subject that affects all of us here today, global warming. warming. What did Hawkins say about that? I don't know specific writings on that. I think he generalized it in the dom into the uh, observation that we are inflicting significant damage to life on Earth. And that he's, he was relatively between pessimistic and paranoid about it. And that's why he explored uh, colonization of other planets. Next question. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if you could clarify the gravitational waves. I'm still struggling to understand. So I guess like when the ruler is expanding and contracting, this is due to the curvature of space. But I, I don't know why the curvature is oscillating. It's like kicking jello, but he'll explain. Uh, 
again, that when I think, when I have a ruler and I think that I have a certain size, there is, it's not, it, it, the, the point is that size is not absolute. And uh, by the way, the, the, this effect that, uh, that I talked about, the, the creation of a wave, a space-time wave, uh, a billion light years from now. We were talking about the energy that created that, that motion of space and time was more than 50 times all the energy that was being emitted by the whole universe. So that's, and then it came here. What did it do? You know, I'm saying we're, we're taking a, a ruler bigger and smaller. But let's say, how much is that ruler being changed? The edge of the ruler is being changed by uh, one thousandth the size of the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. What's amazing is that we're able to measure it. And that's it, is that we have space that I think I have. In other words, you have this experiment, it's called LIGO, it's kilometers that they, they have a size, and they found that the mirrors at the edge of this kilometers, uh, four kilometer uh, length is changing by one thousandth of the size of a nuclear atom. And they're sure of it. That's it. One final question. Let me have a really good one. <laughs> Uh, did, did Hawking, one, one other great challenge to humanity is manipulation of genes. Did, did Hawking say anything about this? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, he was certainly kept up on his science, but remember the gene manipulation, in particular CRISPR and phenomena like that, are very recent. And so I doubt that he would have had time to reflect upon that. But. Uh, if he's concerned about our damaging our future, that's certainly one of the, a possible component. But I'm not sure of any explicit writing that he's done on it. That would be late in his life. That that it's the last six years have been uh, most impressive for the progress in genetic design and manipulation, and that that how that threatens the future of the Earth is much less clear than how AI in a militarized space re would represent a real threat. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> and if you're not an IRP member and you would like to get on our email list, um, see me and I'll add you. Help yourself to refreshments. So, thank you, that was very well managed. <laughs> thank Hi. you.